Hey guys, this is our presentation on the parotid gland. Holly is going to take over for the latter half of the presentation, and Anna, Marsha, Neil, Nikki, and I have um, helped out in producing this presentation. So during the course of this presentation, we will go through the anatomy, the histology, the function, and the clinical significance of the parotid gland. So, uh, parotid gland comes from the word paraotic, which means next to the otic, next to the ear. It is a paired salivary gland. We have two other salivary glands in the body. Those are the submandibular and sublingual glands. And when it comes to the anatomy, it is actually quite interesting. You have the zygomatic arch superiorly. You have the sternocleidomastoid posteriorly, the masseter anteriorly. And the buccinator is the structure that the duct of the parotid gland penetrates into to uh, secrete saliva into your oral cavity. Uh, okay, so when it comes to the blood supply of the parotid gland, you have the posterior auricular artery and the superficial temporal artery, which are branches of the external carotid artery. And the retromandibular vein makes up the major venous drainage of the parotid gland. The retromandibular nerve is, vein is a anastomosis of both the internal jugular vein and the external jugular vein. Uh, the innervation is actually quite complex. You have the parasympathetic fibr fibers, parasympathetic preganglionic fibers traveling with the glossopharyngeal nerve, and then they hitchhike. The postganglionic nerves hitchhike on the auricular temporal nerve to provide parasympathetic stimulation to the Gland. Uh, when it comes to sympathetic, you get supply from the superior cervical chain. Uh, now, I know um, you're probably dying to ask why the parotid gland has sensory innervation. Uh, so hopefully you don't have to ask this question after what I'm about to say. Um, the sensory sensory innervation to the parotid gland is to is to its capsule actually. And what that does is that if you do have a lesion of the parotid gland, you'd be able to feel it. Uh, so hopefully that's, um, yeah. Uh, when it comes to the lymphatic drainage of the parotid gland, we have the preauricular and parotid lymph nodes, which are from the deep cervical chain. Other things that penetrate through the parotid gland are the facial nerve and the external carotid artery and the retromandibular nerve, which I, uh, uh, vein, retromandibular vein, which I have mentioned earlier. So, histology. The parotid gland has two capsules. It has a true capsule, which is its own connective tissue, dense connective tissue, and it also has a false capsule, which is an extension of the deep cervical fascia. The fascia splits into a superficial lamina and deep lamina to enclose the gland. On a cellular level, you have short striated ducts, which are made up of simple columnar epithelium, and long intercalated ducts, which are made up of simple cuboidal epithelium. Okay, so I'm going to cover the function and the uh, clinical significance of the parotid gland. So there are three slidery glands, like Mohammed said. So you've got the parotid gland, you've got the submandibular, and the sublingual. So the parotid gland, um, its role is for serous uh, saliva. Um, then the submandibular is serous and mucus, and the sublingual is mucus. Um, the parotid gland contributes 25% of the total saliva, remembering that we produce 1.5 litres of saliva every day. Um, so the serous saliva, uh, saliva means that it's watery secretion, but it's rich in enzymes. So it's rich in um, salivary alpha amylase enzymes. And saliva alpha amylase, its function is to hydrolyze alpha bonds. So it breaks down large polysaccharides such as starch and glycogen. It breaks down amylase into uh, lactose and it breaks down amylopeptide into glucose. It also reduces the bacterial colonization. Um, we're not 100% sure how this does it, but from what we've read, it says that it reduces the adhesion of the bacteria, meaning that the um, the bacteria can be swallowed and then destroyed in the acidic stomach. So moving on to the clinical significance, mumps is one of the most common pathologies of the parotid gland, which is bilateral or it can be unilateral. 
swelling of the parotid gland, which is painful, and it's caused by viral infections by um, the virus, the mumps virus. Uh, this can be vaccinated against with the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. So another common, another pathology is parotitis, um, which is similar to mumps and the swelling of the parotid gland, um, but this is bacterial instead of um, viral. So it's commonly caused by the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus. You can also get it caused by extrapulmonary TB, where the mycobacterium from the tuberculosis um, causes the condition. So then moving on to neoplasms, 80% um, of all neoplasms of the saliva glands are of the parotid gland. Um, and then 80% of parotid neoplasms are luckily benign, the most common being the adenoma. Um, you can also get malignant neoplasms of the par uh, parotid glands, um, the most common be the mucoepidermoid carcinoma. So finally, we're going to move on to facial nerve palsy, which has been covered quite a lot today. Um, so facial nerve palsy, like uh, other groups of cells, you can get Bell's palsy or complete palsy, um, the difference being in their te uh, course length of time. Um, so we've covered the conditions already. So as it relates to the parotid glands, the, um, you can get sort of neoplasms or infections or tumours or anything like that that can cause facial nerve palsy from the parotid gland. So it won't give, uh, it won't damage things such as lacrimation because that branch is already given off proximal to the parotid gland. But following on from the parotid gland, um, it innovates facial expression. So if there is a problem with the parotid gland, then we'll get such a uh, facial asymmetry due to the damage distal to the parotid gland. Okay, and that's it. So thank you for listening. Have you got any questions?